Okay, Jules, here's your first question. What is your favorite Star Wars toy? Well, that's a really tricky one because when I was growing up, I didn't have a massive amount of Star Wars toys, but the, the toys I really loved were those very first early Palatoy releases uh, for that first Christmas. So I had the Palatoy Death Star, the Cantina, and the Solid Bonnet Landspeeder. And obviously I had almost all the first original 12 figures and then some of the later 2021 figures such as the Cantina ones like Hammerhead, Greedo, uh, uh, the Death Star Droid, ones like that. Um, they were probably, I couldn't pinpoint one particular toy, although I did love the Han Solo uh, laser gun, which I've still got today. Um, but they would be probably my favourite toys. They were the very earliest ones I had as a kid when I was about eight, when that first wave of toys came out. And they're the ones that most resonate with me today as probably my all-time favourite Star Wars toys. In later life, as a collector, I think one of the most impressive toys is probably the Imperial Shuttle. It's just so massive and big, and if I'd have had one of those when I was um, sort of eight or ten years old, I would have just loved it. If you could watch only one Star Wars film for the next ten years, what would it be and why? If I could only watch one Star Wars film for the next ten years, which one would it be? Well, that is such a tough question. Now. By far, my favourite of every Star Wars film ever made is The Empire Strikes Back. And I think it would just have to be that one. Even if I wasn't watching the film, I could listen to that amazing soundtrack. Because for me, that just is the best film soundtrack I've ever heard. And I'm a real, I would say, a soundtrack aficionado. I love all different sorts of movies. And I love soundtracks. But The Empire Strikes Back soundtrack by John Williams is perhaps what will swing it to be, if I could only watch one movie, it would be that one. Because I could even listen to it without watching the film because the soundtrack is just so good. So that would be my answer to that one. If you could be any Star Wars character, who would you be and why? So if I could be any sort of Star Wars character from the entire Star Wars universe, I suppose, well, rather than being a particular character, I would like to be someone, like, well, a Jedi, someone who had the power of the Force. So it would be fantastic to be able to uh, have those powers, to manipulate people's minds and uh, move stuff without having to, uh, with just the gesture of your hand, it would just be amazing. I think for fun reasons, it would probably be to be a Jedi of some sort. I would probably be a good Jedi. I wouldn't be on the dark side. I would be on the light side. Just, just so you know. Do you collect or own any other intellectual property collectibles like Black Hole or Tron, anything like that at all? If so, what are they? Okay, well, if you've had a look at my channel, you'll see that I collect a hell of a lot of stuff apart from Star Wars. Now, I've collected Star Wars pretty much since it was around, and I've you know made a living selling it for 10 years in, in my shop um but yes i do collect other intellectual properties so around the same time as star wars i started collecting tron and the black hole toys not obsessively but as they came my way i would always pick stuff up um but i do also collect lots of other things i mean so many other things um i've got collections of like doctor who memorabilia i've got um uh, the various uh paperbacks and books collections which are extensive um my comic book collection which i haven't even got around to showing hardly any on the channel just yet but there's literally well it's nowhere near what it used to be because i've thinned it out a bit but you know just the star wars comics alone will probably be a series of 10 videos there's literally that many and that's just the vintage ones um so yeah the comic book collection um uh, rare first editions that sort of thing i collect um uh, I've got, <laughs> well, I just don't know where to start. There's so much, you know, I've got a soundtrack collection. I've got a Laserdisc collection. I've got videos. I've got uh, old video games. Now, I used to be massively into collecting video games and just for space reasons, I've had to um, thin that right down. And in actual fact, most of my retro video games, because you can play them on emulators these days, the actual only video game system that I'm actively trying to put a run together of is original Xbox, if you can believe it. So in Europe, there was just under 900 or so titles released and i reckon i'm about halfway there i've got most of the rare ones now so it's just a matter of uh slotting in some of the uh, the more easier 
uh, and cheaper titles to finish that run off. So that's something which I've yet to cover um, on the channel. I collect autographs. I've you know I've been to countless conventions and shows over the years, and stuff just accumulates. And um, my grandfather was a huge collector. He used to collect Toby jugs and stamps of all things. And um, I reckon the gene was passed on to me because I've collected stuff all my life. The problem is, although I'm always happy to get rid of stuff if needs be, you know, like I got rid of most of my video game collection simply because I needed the space and I wanted to put to concentrate on putting that the proceeds from that into something else that I was into. Um, there's always something that as a collector you're going to want to get. So as I said, I've got several collections on the go at, at the moment, um, but overriding my main sorts of collections are within the sort of sci-fi fantasy worlds um, as well as vintage American and British paperbacks. Um, as I said, first editions, I collect old space Lego. There's all sorts of things that I wouldn't say I was massively into, but I've got some of. Um, Simpsons, Simpsons and Futurama stuff. I kid you not, and I've only done a couple of unboxing videos, I must have 50 boxes of Simpsons and Futurama toys because when I had the shop, you know, this stuff, I, I was around when the Simpsons first came out and I bought all that the first few years, I bought all the toys and merchandise related to it, exactly the same with Futurama. And that stuff is like 20, 30 years old now, and it's aged really well. And there's lots of Simpsons and Futurama fans out there. But that alone is just, it's just nuts. And um, it creates a problem as a collector, because what do you do? Do you just sell it on or do you just leave it in storage for a rainy day? Who can tell? But maybe we'll get to that. It's another story, but suffice to say, as well as you know, Star Wars and, and the other sci-fi collectibles, there's a whole lot that I collect. And, you know, that is why I thought to start this channel, because it's going to be pretty varied, the sort of stuff that you'll see, but it will be all sort of related and um, within a few set genres. So hopefully there's something for everyone. I want to know, how do you store all of those magnificent vintage collectibles. What does it look like? How do you store them? Do you store them in storage bins? Do you put them in a closet? Are they in boxes? How do you maintain and keep such an awesome vintage collection? So how do I maintain and store and or display my vintage collection? Well, it's really, really hard because you know, I'm in a normal sized house. I'm a family man. I've got two kids and a wife and a dog. <laughs> uh, so it's quite difficult to have anything like what I would ideally like out. Um, and I've just got too much to put out at the moment. That's not to say that in the future, you know, once the kids are grown up and left home, I might have a spare room or two where I'll be able to get the collection out. So that is the ultimate aim, but that ain't happening anytime soon. So in the meantime, uh, the bulk of the toys are in long-term storage. They're not even here. Uh, they're in like a, a storage unit. And that is why I bring a few boxes back each time and I just film what was in there. As well as filming them, I do take photographs of anything I've not got a picture of. So I've got a really good record of what I've actually got in my collection. And if you've watched any of the videos, um, like when I've unboxed my um, Millennium Falcon, for example, I spotted that it didn't have the original instructions. So little things like that I'm making a note of. Some of the figures that I've got have really aged badly. And that's just because um, the bubbles have gone yellow or the memory sometimes cheats. You know you've got one and you sort of forget about it. But when you get it out again 20 years later, you think, cool, that's not very good condition. So I'm going to replace that one. So I've been doing quite a bit of that as I've been taking stuff out and filming it. Most of my book collection is actually out on display. So I've got some beside me here, but that's basically the, 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 you know, the, the tip of the iceberg. I've got stuff all over the house book related. And uh, that's because, you know, I mean, books are a bit more accessible. Um, I don't really feel there's a lot of point having them unless I can go and grab a book and uh, expand on the collection as well. You know, I'm, a, I'm an avid reader and I do enjoy the collection. But toys wise, I'm afraid to say it ain't all out on display. It was once I had rooms devoted to it. But, you know, time goes on, family stuff happens and uh, you just can't have it all out on display. I'm not bitter, but that is why I'm getting such a great kick out of getting it all out and looking at some of this stuff for the, literally the first time in, in, a, in like 20 years and loving it. And I hope that that sort of comes across in the videos that this is the first time I've seen a lot of this stuff in years. Um, sometimes, you know, over 20 years, in fact. So um, eventually it'll all come out and I'll have it all on display. But for the time being, alas, it's all 
toys wise it's all in that long-term storage and it's mainly just my uh, my paperbacks and a few other valuables uh, uh, parts of the collection that I've got actually to hand. What advice would you give someone who is considering taking the leap into Star Wars vintage collecting? So what advice would I give someone who is uh, just getting into thinking about collecting vintage Star Wars? I would say first of all don't be put off by the prices that you might hear. Uh, oh, massive, uh, massive sales on eBay. Yeah, figure, Boba Fett figure fetch is $100,000 or something like that. Believe me, you could start collecting vintage Star Wars for just a, a couple of pounds a figure or, or a few dollars for a figure. Um, I would suggest if, if you want to collect the toys uh, predominantly, that initially perhaps you just um, put together a loose set. Now, if it was me and I was starting from scratch, I would be scouring somewhere like eBay or in the UK, somewhere like Echo Base, which is a Facebook group, but there's many others. And I will be looking for a bulk job lot, a starter collection, where you can get maybe, say out of the, you know, approximately a hundred and a bit figures, you can pick up maybe half of them in a job lot, a couple of hundred dollars, a couple of hundred quid, something like that. Just enough to get you off and running. Take what you can from that. There'll probably be a few that you'll want to just put in the bin or have as fillers, but use that as the basis for your collection and grow on it. And, you know, maybe just set a little goal. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna collect a loose set. I'm gonna try and get one or two figures a week. So set your heart on, on trying to just do that and think small because else it can just run away with you. Um, you know, if you were just dipping your toe in the water, that would be my sort of advice is just start small. It may be that you're not into the figures. Now, there's not many people like it, but I love all the oddball stuff that comes with Star Wars. So, I mean, I know a lot of people collect like the trading cards, but the more obscure or weird the Star Wars item is, like, you know, coloring insets or roller skates or, you know, lightsabers, things like that, um, it is the more I actually like it. Um, you know, I've got some really, if you've looked at any of my unboxing videos, you'll see all sorts of stuff. The old vintage stationery, I absolutely love that. Um, I love badges. It's just a real mixture of stuff. I would just say buy what attracts you and what you like, um, and you really, really don't need to spend a lot of money on it. But say you, you know, two years down the line or a year down the line, you've got your complete vintage loose collection and you want to say, take the, you know, the step into collecting carded. Well, even that is not a fortune. You can pick up figures for say the most common figures, some of the Ewoks, Gamori guards, something like that, say 50 pounds or $80 for, you know, an okay sort of carded example. All right, the real rare ones is going to set you back in the hundreds but not all of them will. And you can still get a really tidy cardi collection. You know, if you do, you know, one or two a month over a few years, you'll soon get to have a really impressive collection. The other good thing, of course, is a lot of the ships have really not gone massively up in price. So even the iconic ones, such as the Atta, the Millennium Falcon, real mint ones, a couple of hundred dollars, a couple of hundred pounds, and you'll have those and they look fantastic. Um, the little ships, mini rigs, they're dirt cheap, you know, 20, 30 pounds, um, you know, a, a Hoth Wampa or something like that is not going to set you back a fortune, but these things are great and they're cheap. There'll always be some that will be expensive, the Palatoy Death Star, set you back a grand or, um, you know, the Cantina's a few hundred quid and things like that, but you don't need to concentrate on them. You can get a really good collection of stuff for fairly cheap money. And I would just say, just dip your toe in the water, check out some of those Facebook groups. Bargains are to be had on eBay, but to be honest, most recently if for buying and selling, I would use the Facebook groups because they do seem to be the way forward and no fees as well. So that would be, uh, well, the start of my advice if you were just about thinking about getting into collecting vintage Star Wars, but that there's so much to it. Um, but I hope, hope that's useful anyway. Okay. So one question I have that that I'm curious about is on your channel, you've got Star Wars collectibles and you've got books, lots of books. Talk to me about those. Tell us what is with all of those books. So, well, you are right, Ben, in that um, I've got lots and lots of books in the collection. And that is simply because I am a bit of an obsessive reader and book collector. And I guess I always have been since I was a kid. Um, the first sort of book series I ever remember collecting were the Doctor Who Target books. And uh, those I'm trying to, I'm almost there to put in a run of those back together again now. But for about the last 30 or so years, I started collecting vintage paperbacks. Now, 
back then, um, in the late 80s, early 90s, you could still find a hell of a lot of these around everywhere um, in the UK. And even in the UK, you would find uh, American imports that come over, books from right around the world in actual fact. So my main focus for British paperbacks, um, I collect by publisher. So Penguin Books, which started in 1935, I collect them up from 35 up to about 1970, as well as the best of like modern years. And um, that in itself, to try and get all of those, everything that they published in that those 35 years in first edition, you are talking the best part of five to 6,000 books in total, um, of which I've perhaps got two thirds now. Okay, so that just that publisher alone is, is ridiculous when you think about it. That it would fill a room. And um, while I'm talking about this, I'm going to drop some photos in so you can see when I've had these collections out, just the amount of vintage paperbacks that we're talking about here. We are, it's in the thousands. Um, and I don't know quite how many I've got, but it's probably, well, I don't know, 8,000 maybe, six to 8,000. I mean, I wouldn't like to say, but it's in the thousands. Um, my other uh, main publisher that I collect, British publisher, is Pam Books. So they started in uh, 1945. They were a bit of a rival to Penguin. And I collect them once again up to 1970. 1970 is the cutoff for me generally, because that was when ISBNs came in. So I, I collect the publisher and I collect them by numbers. So Penguin literally used a numbering system like comic books, one, two, three, four, five. Pan had their own numbering system and, and various like, offshoots. Then there's other British publishers that I like. So Albatross Books, which is pre-1935, published on the continent and imported into Britain. I collect Badger Books, Digit Books, Panther Books, um, uh, Four Square paperbacks. And then I've got a collection of movie and TV tie-ins. That itself is, is about a thousand books. Um, then we go on to the American publishers. So I collect basically any vintage American publisher that comes on I me. Mean, now they don't turn up very often in Britain, but when nice copies do turn up, I don't turn them down. And I've got basically examples from all sorts of the American publishers um, in Ace Books, Berkeley, um, Fawcett, uh, Pocket Books. I've got them all. I have not full series by any means, but I've got examples from them all. And the, those, once again, is a few hundred paperbacks there. Then there's paperback book series. So I collect, um, as I said, I mentioned the Doctor Who books. There's a you know, couple of hundred of them. Then there would be the Gore books by John Norman, the Casca books by Barry Sadler, um, the Three Investigator books, Mad Paperbacks, um, uh, yeah, Hammer Film Times. I mean, I, the, all the James Bond books. The, the list is almost endless. Um, I collect books that are related to comic book series, so comic books that have been shrunk down into paperback form, photo novels, I've done videos on those. Um, there's there's a lot of books, I guess. <laughs> um, but that's what it is. They're fun. They're cheap. That's one of the things. So if you know what you're looking for, you can find some real bargains. Obviously, there's some rarities. Um, but I've been collecting so long that I've been able to amass a really sort of good collection without having to pay a fortune. Um, some series, like I've been trying to get together a run of vintage um, Star Trek books are just, just sort of behind me here, just related to books for the original series. So right back to 1965, 66, when the first Trek books came out up until about 1990, 92, 93, just for the classic series. And those are dirt cheap. I mean, you've got to sometimes buy a big job lot and pick out the bits and pieces that you want. But it's just an example. Um, it's cheap. It's cheerful. You know, people aren't generally big readers anymore. They're on their phones, on their tablets. They're consuming video. There's not a lot of people who are doing lots of reading, but I love it. And um, that is consequently why I guess I collect so many vintage paperbacks because they're cheap and cheerful. How long have you been collecting? Well, that's actually quite an easy question because um, I've been collecting I think probably since I was about seven or eight years old. So at that time, as I mentioned beforehand, um, I had started picking up the Doctor Who books and keeping them and forming a collection which slowly grew and, and grew and grew and grew on my uh, bookcase. But around that time, um, 
My mum was buying me Star Wars Weekly, the comic, every week, right from number one. So boom, 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 every week. Um, a, a year after that, in 1979, Doctor Who Weekly came out. I started collecting that week after week and keeping all the copies in like ring binders. Uh, uh, not ring binders, but box files. So I had a collection there. I was buying 2000 AD comic as well. So I had a bit of sci-fi influence. And that was probably the genesis of me collecting. Uh, I did collect a lot of Doctor Who stuff. Um, uh, the British annuals, which I haven't even touched on yet, but, you know, there was the British Doctor Who annuals, the Star Trek annuals. I collected the Giles annuals. There was there was a lot of those every year. And over the course of those early years, from, you know, being about eight or nine, seven, eight or nine, up until an early teen, they were the formative years where I did start collecting more and more stuff. And um, once again, as kids do, I swapped it, I traded it. Um, but, you know, there was no internet back then. But um, when I was out and about, jumble sales, boot sales, school fates and fairs, I'd be adding stuff to it. I remember being over the moon when I found a 60s, um, a rare 60s Patrick Troughton annual at a jumble sale for like 20, 20p. Sort of thing that's worth about £100, 100 pound today. Um, but it was the thrill of the hunt and finding something rare like that. It was finding a little bit of gold. And those, I think, are the, the, the core the core things at the bottom of being a collector it's inside you and um, that you will find something super rare um, i picked up a particularly rare penguin book recently um, as far as we know there's literally only four copies of this penguin book in existence and it's like a very rare like advanced proof copy of the very first penguin it's got like a different colored jacket to it and it is particularly rare those are the sort of, sorts of things that get my uh, my pulse racing as a collector. But yeah, that was the the seeds of me being a collector from about seven or eight years old, and I've never ever lost it, and I, I still collect to this day. Is there anything that you regret passing up? Anything you regret not buying in your history? So, is there anything I regret not buying? Well, yeah, loads of stuff. Um, when I had the shop. It was a business and, um, you know, myself and my business partner, we had strict rules. We both collected different sorts of things, but we were ultimately a business and you couldn't keep everything. And we, believe me, we got some amazing stuff through our hands that it was just too expensive to keep. You know, we were a business. We had to, you know, we were in the business of selling stuff. We couldn't just keep everything that came in the door. Um, but there were a few things that passed through our hands. That I think, wow. On reflection, boy, I wish I'd um, you know made the sacrifice at the time to buy that and keep it. Um, so there were a few things that I think of now that we had in the shop that I do wish I would kept because um, I could have got them, you know, much cheaper. I'm never going to get them now. One of them was like um, the diecast Star Wars Tie Bomber. It, I could have got one. Um, I had a friend of mine picked up a case of twelve in Japan. This is in the early '90s. Brought them back um, at the time. He had no idea how much they were worth, so uh, he was selling them in his shop at twenty-five pounds each. And as I said, he had twelve of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, he gave us one. I could have had one of them dirt cheap. I, re I remember regretting that. There was um, a Star Wars like slot car racing set. Could have got one of those cheap. Um, a couple of key items that are absolutely, you know, might blow your mind a bit. One of them. Um, in the 60s, there was a TV related comic called TV 21. And on the back um, of the comic, the full page back cover each week was a Dalek strip. It was just called the Daleks and it was a one-off page. And um, a friend of ours, a dealer, um, had managed to find someone who worked on the comic. It wasn't the original artist, but someone who worked on the comic. And he basically picked up a carload of original TV21 artwork. And he came down to the shop with the first, I think it was from issue five of TV21 up to about issue 30, all the back, the original back cover artwork. £400 a page it was. That's all he wanted for it. And I just couldn't really afford it at the time, but what a steal. I mean, a single page of that now, you could add, you could probably get eight grand for something like that, eight or eight to 10,000 for just one of those. But back then, you know, admittedly 25 or 26 years ago, I could have had a, one of those pages for 400 quid. That pales in comparison to my all time Star Wars regret. And I might even do a video on this, but the original British Star Wars poster, as painted by Tom Chantrell, um, the original artwork for that. Uh, so when I had the shop, 
um, a rep used to come in to see us and he was an obsessive film poster collector and um, he got in contact with Tom Chantrell, the original artist of that Star Wars quad and he said what have you got? I've got a, a massive Star Wars collector in Plymouth um, and you know if you've got anything related to it he'd probably be interested and he said well he had the original, and I've st this is what I do have, um, I've got his his original um, front of house stills for the first film, a press pack where it's called The Star Wars uh, with a synopsis of the film and some of the reference shots that he took to make that poster. However, I was offered for five grand the original Star Wars artwork. Now I'll, I'll drop a picture in, you'll instantly recognise it. Much smaller than the actual finished quad, which was blown up to fit UK cinema quad size. So it's that original Star Wars artwork. Now I believe it was never sold as far as I know and the family still have that which is probably the best thing but at the time I could have had that for five grand which was a fortune back then you know that was like a third of a house or something you know what I mean but um that sort of piece today if you had that original Star Wars poster artwork and it was in an auction in Sotheby's you'd probably get a hundred grand for it so potentially that's probably my biggest Star Wars regret but there's no way I could have come up with five grand back then so it's not the end of the world it's but to have it there in my hands it's like oh my god i almost you know froze in like pinch myself sort of thing so uh yeah that was probably my biggest star wars regret i hear you did a bit of acting back in the day were you in anything that i possibly could have seen brady bunch partridge family anything at all well you are absolutely right so i suppose it all started back in the early 90s. Um, I did a few bits for the local theatre company. One of them was quite a big production called High Heels in the Rubble. Now that was about Plymouth, which is the city where I live. It was quite heavily blitzed during the war, 1941-1942 were the, the worst years. Um, and uh, someone had written a play um, and the theatre wanted all local Plymouthians to play parts in it. So I had a, a at the time, I think I was about 17 or 18, and I had a role as um, as a youngster in the Home Guard. I was too young for National Service, um, so I hadn't been called up, but I was in, like in the Home Guard. A bit like the character um, uh, Pike in Dad's Army, if you've ever seen that one, sort of the young, young boy. Um, so that was my first sort of steps into the world of acting, as it were. Um, I did do a few other bits a few years after that, and it was all theatre based. Um, but then in the shop in Purple Haze, um, we had a book, and I'm just wondering if I've got a copy of it here. Um, in fact, I have, yeah. So in the shop, um, we had uh, this book come in, which was, um, you can be a movie and TV extra. Now, I always remember getting this because um, I thought, well, I would love to do some extra work um, and things like that. And, um, that's something from the BBC there. And um, in fact, this is, this is I think, my um, Doctor Who pay slip. Um, but yeah, I'd always uh, been fascinated by it and I thought I'd love to do some extra work. And this, this book here um, told you how to do it. So this guy here, Rob Martin, uh, don't know if, I mean, this is a 20 year old book now, but he was a, um, he, he ran a casting firm. I think it was called The Casting Collective in London. And he had just done the casting for Gladiator and Band of Brothers, which had just been filmed over in Britain. And um, there was basically a national shortage of men um, because uh, Band of Brothers was a six month filming schedule and um, they, they literally just didn't have enough men. So there were people, I'd heard about this on the grapevine, that there would be people who had literally given up work for six months and were becoming full time extras. And Band of Brothers um, was paying really good money because it was all on location which ironically pays more than studio work because you're out with the elements. The days can be quite long. If you have a haircut, you get extra money. Um, they were training them up to be able to handle weaponry and things like that. And I thought, oh, I would have loved to have done that. Gladiator the same. They used hundreds of extras. So that original battle at the start of Gladiator was filmed in the UK and it was the Germans versus the Romans. That amazing, amazing battle. And I've met people since who were, who were at that. And, um, you know, when I've done some filming and they said, yeah, it was, it was amazing. They were on like 150 pound a day um, and they were just having the time of their lives. You're fully fed, you're watered, you're looked after. And you're on the set of an amazing 
Ridley Scott movie. I mean, how cool can it be? So I thought on the basis of that, and both those are mentioned in here, I thought I've got to get into this and you need to do it properly. So I became in effect a professional supporting artist. So I joined a couple of agencies that are local to the southwest of England and I then started getting work coming through. So I was lucky in the fact that because I was self-employed when I started doing this, one of the key things about being a supporting artist is you don't have a lot of notice. You've sometimes got a day or two um, and then you need to be there on set. So you need to be flexible. So for a lot of people, that's just not possible if they're um, following quite a strict uh, regime or their work isn't very good um, in regards to them having time off. But for me, because I was self-employed, I could wangle it so that I could take the time off to do filming. So I started off by doing things like um, in Britain Casualty, which is like a, a weekly uh, drama set in a hospital. At the time it was filmed in Bristol. It's now filmed in Cardiff, but that's only Bristol's only you know, two hours away. So I was actually on a, ironically, a casualty emergency list. So if they were particularly short of people for casualty, as long as I hadn't done it in the six weeks prior to that, because you could only be on casualty once every six weeks, you'd then be able to just, I could just whip up the motorway in a couple of hours and they'd use me there and then for the rest of the day. And I get, you know, really good money for that. Um, so that's how I started. And then if there was something being filmed locally, sort of in Devon and Cornwall where I am, um, I generally get a phone call to be in it. So um, the final season of Down to Earth, I was in that three or four times uh, with Ricky Tomlinson. And that was a very small crew and you really did feel part of the family for that one. Um, I remember doing some adverts in Cornwall. I did um, uh, a German movie with Maximilian Schnell from um, the Black Hole fame. So that was fantastic. <laughs> I had no idea he was going to be there. And I actually got to meet him and talk to him. Um, and that was a, a film called The Shell Seekers which is made by a German film company that was filmed in Headland Point, which is where they film Doc Martin. Um, I did another film down there, which was with Clive Owen and Kira Knightley, who I met both of them and some of the other cast, and that was King Arthur. Um, I did another film in Cornwall called, um, uh, well, it's Alice in, Alice in Wonderland, and it was the first Tim Burton one. I know he did two. It was the first Tim Burton one, and I was in some scenes in Charlestown, right there in the background with the main cast. Um, uh, I was like man on dock. I didn't have any lines or anything, but I always remember the story where um, uh, Tim Burton is on a boat and he's looking over to the dock. So the main cast are right in front of me. I'm just behind and he's going through people and he picks me. I said, me? He said, yeah, he said, just move it because he's doing the classic sort of thing like that. Just move like that. And I moved over like this. And I remember whispering to my mate, I've just been directed by Tim Burton. <laughs> which was amazing. Absolutely. What an experience those sorts of things are. My all t I did some TV stuff as well. So um, I remember traveling to, I did a Miss Marple in Dartmouth. That was towards zero. I did that one. But by far the best thing I ever got around to doing was a Doctor Who. So I think you probably would have seen this one, Ben, or possibly um, it's come across your radar. So I was in a, this is of the modern series. So it was season two. So Christopher Eccleston had just left the role um, and David Tennant had taken over. Um, and it was Tennant's fifth story, I think fifth or sixth story. And it was called Rise of the Cybermen. And um, I couldn't believe I had the phone call. So I said, Jules, do you want to, this is one of my agents, do you want to, um, being Doctor Who and we got the part of a photographer. Do you know how to work a camera? I said, yeah, of course I can work a camera. They said, well, this is on the Friday. They said, well, we want you there on Monday. It's probably going to be a few days filming. Are you free for that? I said, absolutely for Doctor Who. I'll do absolutely anything. It was my absolute dream. And one of the reasons why I wanted to get into it. Now it was filmed in Cardiff, which is just a couple of hours from where I am, or where I live. And um, yeah, I went to the, to the Doctor Who set. I was, I was pinched. I had no idea what was going to be like. Um, but when I got there, I was, I was welcomed. I was really early. Um, I can remember walking in and seeing a pyramid of Cyberman helmets and they hadn't been officially revealed yet or anything. And I was like, Oh, this is amazing. I remember looking at the portaloo <laughs> and there was three Cyberman actors and they were half Cybermen from the waist down, the tops, they were just in like t-shirts these three bulky, bulky guys in a portaloo and the whole portaloo was shaking. <laughs> Um, cause they were in there. Oh, just hilarious. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a Cyberman story. And then I, I looked over and I saw David Tennant and Billy Piper and there was Nick Briggs who does, he was famous for doing the Dalek voices, but he also did the voices of the Cybermen. And 
yeah, I was there. I got put into costume. I did the makeup and I, I did a few days filming on that. And amazingly, um, I knew the director. So Graham Harper, I'd met years ago when I was a Doctor Who fan back in the 80s. And I actually got to speak to him. It was, you know, they were setting up my shot where I, I was really lucky in that I got picked to be in a close up where um, the Cyberman grabs me and sort of electrocutes me. And I sort of fall back onto some mats and stuff. And while we were setting that up, I just said, oh, Graham, you're probably not going to remember this, but Graham Harper was one of the directors who worked on the classic Doctor Who series back in the 80s. And um, I knew a bit about his film career anyway, some of the other stuff that he'd done. Um, and I just started talking to him about it. And we ended up talking for half an hour. And it was just amazing that, uh, talking to this. And he, I don't think he could believe I knew quite so much about you know, his career and um, some of the old series. But I said, you know, you don't remember this, but I got you to sign my autograph book back in the 80s. <laughs> and we had a really good chat then. I can't believe, like 20, 30 years later, I'm here being directed by you in a Doctor Who story. It was just incredible. And that particular one, it was an absolute geek's dream come through, come true, because I was such a big Doctor Who fan. And I had such a really good bit in, in, um, in the episode. And my actual death, where I get electrocuted, was then used, because it was a two-parter, in the reprise of the following episode and then that particular scene it, it kept turning up everywhere um it was in um jonathan ross did a thing and it was like the top um 100 christmas toys one year uh, the year i did it uh, 2007 i think it was was um dalek and Cyberman toys and my death was used in one of the clips there that was on another channel that was on like channel four it wasn't even bbc it was used on the kids uh, uh totally doctor who it was in doctor who confidential um i got invited to conventions if you can believe it so i, I spoke at a couple of conventions i went on a podcast as well where i was doing some stuff absolutely phenomenal and um I would recommend it as a little hobby because you don't need any acting ability, although a little bit of confidence obviously helps, but anyone can do it. And um, boy, oh boy, did I, uh, I enjoyed doing the Doctor Who. Um, but yeah, all sorts of things um, come my way. And um, I, you know, I've got an equity card, but nowadays, because I don't have a job where I can just, you know, book a day off willy nilly, um, I do need a bit of forward planning. Um, I don't tend to put myself forward for stuff uh, anymore, simply because, um, yeah, I haven't got that flexibility. But certainly when I retire or possibly go part time in work, I should be back on it then because they want the good thing is with being like a supporting artist, they want people of all shapes, sizes, ages, hair color, the work. So the more unusual you look, probably the better you'll be. Um, so there you go. Hopefully, I reckon you've probably seen me in, in Doctor Who. Well, so just to finish, Ben, thank you so much for asking me those cool questions. I really enjoyed uh, answering those for you. Mine are on their way to you now. So I'm looking forward to you answering my questions. Thanks again, mate. Bye.